Yeehaw, as our American cousins would say, for this video is taking a stateside slant as I show you lovely fools some Yankee Klein tools. You know, I actually quite like Klein stuff. Uh, look, they even sent me a hat a few years ago with my old logo that they took the time to custom embroider onto the sides. That was back in the days when they'd talk to me, of course. Now, like the likes of Unilite, I don't even get acknowledgements to legitimate product email queries, although I use the wares of both companies and have never slagged off either. When brands I haven't badmouthed go radio silent on me, it makes me wonder if that's because of my association with other loudmouths, such as the Marmite Biffins of Electricians podcast. I mean, we all know Jamie famously fell out with Unilite a couple of years ago, so maybe his salty yeast extract is rubbing off onto my fresh toast. If so, it reminds me of being back at school in 1987, when I was busy mates with Nirmal and Mandip, until I fell out with each other, and then Nirmal told me I couldn't be his wingman anymore because I still got on with Mandip, and Mandip told me we couldn't be muckers because I didn't share the beef he happened to have with Nirmal. Meanwhile, I'm wondering where all my friggin' mates have gone because I haven't done anything to fall out with anybody. I mean, when your friends have all left you, what's a 13-year-old boy going to do on his own stuck in his bedroom for hours on end? Besides wanking himself mental. So yeah, flashbacks to 1987 aside, I still like you, Klein, even though the products I'll be showing here today kind of don't work, and I'll have to point out their flaws. Not that Klein UK should care too much because this video, as I said, is about North American hardware and nothing on the market, or likely to be on the market, of these sorry, soggy shores. You know, to get into the correct spirit for this presentation, I feel I ought to sport my spiffing Klein hat back to front, just as our American cousins would do. Hmm. Oh yes. Check me out, homeboys. Why, I already feel like I would blend right in, strolling around the likes of the Bronx, high-fiving the natives, addressing law enforcement officers as motherfuckers, and spray-painting penises onto public transportation infrastructure. I'm coming all US of A in your face because I've obtained two Siemens Yankee Doodle Arc Fault Circuit Interrupters, or AFCIs, the American equivalent of our Arc Fault Detection Devices, AFDDs. I've had these shipped in so that I can play with two test instruments, Klein's RT310 Outlet Tester and their RT390 Circuit Analyzer, both of which boast the ability to test an Arc Fault Interrupter, at least in a basic way. Nonetheless, that's still something no handheld instrument here in Blighty can do, so it'll be interesting to see if these do do the do that Klein claim they do, or if they do not. Before I can show this gear in action, I uh, need to fit my AFCIs into a suitable enclosure. Uh, unfortunately, I bought an unsuitable enclosure. Still, I'll make it work by hook or by crook. And a shout out to my man Chuck Kirchner in Maine, longtime viewer and supporter of this channel, who advised me of the correct terms to even search for when procuring foreign hardware from my little island. Load center, as it turns out, is what our American cousins seem to call their equivalent to our consumer units. And Chuck did advise that one has to match protective device brands with enclosures to ensure compatibility. Sage advice that I immediately ignored because getting hold of a genuine USA load center from over here is tricky and expensive. So despite ordering Siemens gear, I plumped for a Schneider Square D box to slap them into as that was about the cheapest I could find, even though it's still over a ton delivered. <sighs> Cut to a slightly younger version of me from earlier in October where I spaff my Siemens into Schneider's hole. Check out this October sunshine. I'll tell you what, it's 22 Celsius out here. We often have it quite nice for the first couple of weeks of October, and then it turns to shit for about six months. Sun goes in as soon as I say that. Look, but let's have a closer look at this thing. This is the, the Square D QO range of load centers, which is what I've plumped for. Perhaps not quite accurately, but so we'll come to that in a minute. Oh, warning, this product can expose you to chemicals, including lead and lead compounds, which are known to the state of California to cause cancer. Is there anything in California that doesn't cause cancer? I'm always seeing these labels about how things are different in California for some reason, but never mind. Let's have a look at what the box boasts about this Square D product. QO circuit breakers and load centers are widely regarded as the world's finest. 
They set the quality and reliability standards for circuit protection and are preferred by more electrical contractors and other building professionals than any other brand. Whew, the world's finest. I wonder if they use that like they use World Series as in, uh, yeah, it's okay in America, but nobody else in the world actually touches this stuff. Who knows? Anyway, here's what we have. We have a substantial enclosure. That is some very thick steel. It's got some good weight to that, I must admit. And these, these knockouts, or twists out, they call them, uh, over there. Obviously, this is a, a two-way board configured for one-way operation out of the box. But let's take a look inside the beast, the beast of the thing. We've got this nifty little dingus bar here and these clippy bits. And what I mean by that, I've got a couple of square D breakers here. Now, this one came from a board installed in the mid-90s. It's actually got 95 stamped on it. And this is a, a more modern variant because Schneider took over square deers. Schneider take over everything, don't they, for goodness sake? And, and seem to charge about five times the price of everybody else as well. <laughs> but we can see on here that this is compatible with the QO range. So these devices ought to fit this board. And as we can see, we do have a plastic clip for the dingus rail, and we do have a metallic clip for the live line, hot, whatever you want to call it. Our American cousins would call it the hot bit, I, I imagine. <laughs> Uh, we, we clip that on there, we clip that on there, and it, it's a very satisfying clip-on, strap-on, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there we go, we've replaced our cover, and there's our breaker. Notice no over-cover like you would get in this country. Uh, there's no, no flap going over it. Uh, it, it also interesting that they've labelled them as circuit ways 1 and 2, with circuit 2, circuit way 2 being the open one by default. That's going to mess with somebody's feng shui. And they couldn't even get this label on straight, it seems, which is you know, kind of not too bad, I suppose. Anyway, I'm just picking hairs here. It's, what's interesting to me is, is the internal construction. So you've got your two connections here for your two circuit ways. They're not electrically linked. They're quite separate. We also have here something that is electrically linked. You can see that's all one piece of metal. Uh, this is labelled here as neutral going in the top and your ground or your earthing components here, but they're all quite separate to the metal enclosure itself. This screw does not pass through any of these, any passed through plastic, it doesn't pass through anything that would be earth. So here you would see an earth bar very much as part of the metal enclosure and the neutral quite separate, but, but in this thing it seems to all be quite, quite part of being one and the same. Again, let me know if I've got the wrong end of the stick here. The instructions with this thing aren't particularly great. You've got some, some pictures here showing earthing and neutral all being part of the same bar. Fine, okay. What is interesting uh, and quite annoying as well is that uh, not all devices are made the same. So although Square D do make AFDDs, I haven't been able to get hold of them. It's been very hard to get hold of any kind of... American equipment on these shores. I'm about to pay over the odds for this, which is the cheapest enclosure I can find. And yes, it may well work fine with Square D breakers, as this is, and perhaps even Square D AFDDs, which are thin and tall, it seems, unlike my fat and squat Siemens, which have the same kind of connection method in that they sit on a dingus rail and have clipping bars at the top there but a, a, a way to squat to work with this, which is a shame, but not entirely surprising. The company I bought it from did say, if you want to use Siemens products, you should use a Siemens board. I guess it's kind of like the type testing we have over here in that you're not supposed to mix and match. Fine, okay, well, I, I, it was very hard to get technical data. Uh, I took a punt and these things aren't going to fit in this board as is, but never mind, because what I should do is I shall completely bastardize it. Lifetime warranty? I don't fucking think so, not by the time I've finished with it. I'll have this lot out, I'll drop these in, I'll get my saw onto it to open up the front more. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? But never mind, because it's here to do a specific job, and that job is to house these two AFDDs in something that you would find in America, even if it's not something that is compatible with what I've got here. And I'm going to be wiring it in a, a different way to normal anyway, because these two are going to be switchable to a socket to allow me to do some, some testing. So I'll be able to switch whether we're using this device or this device. So it's not, 
not all going to go together w well with this anyway, so never mind, never mind. Let's have this out. I'll make it work. What can go wrong? So there's our module. That feels a bit flimsy. That doesn't feel like it's got quite the same quality as the enclosure. And, and yeah, like I say, separate connections going into the devices. And our neutral and earthing all seemingly on the same rail there. But what we have here is a fine box. You can see as well that once when the cover is placed on it, it overlaps, allowing you to, to flush fit or surface mount as you see fit. I don't know why American stuff has to look like it, it all came out of the Korean War. It's, it's got no particular sort of style to it, has it? It's all quite utilitarian. Looks like it would be at home on a battleship as much as in your home utility room. Let's do some modifications then. Like I say, I'll, I'll get these somehow sitting inside of here. I don't know how I'm going to do that yet, but mechanically I've got a job on my hands to, to make it work. And I may as well piss around while the sun is shining. And here it all is on my wall of interesting cack. And no, I won't show you inside the Schneider board as the, uh, the gubbins were removed entirely for some proper shonky mechanics to hold my AFCIs in place and get them electrically hooked up. This switch dials either the uh, left or the right device to this double socket outlet here, which is a funky thryon thang that allows all sorts of plug types to connect. And again, that's just because trying to get a genuine North American outlet here is a proper pain in the ass. All this good old gear is at 120 volt here, of course, thanks to this transformer snaffled off an iffy internet bazaar, where British standards are wholly ignored as proven by the accompanying IC lead, which those of you who have kept an eye on my shit-stained shorts will know as wired ass about elbow, with the neutral pin of the plug top being wired to the line pin of the IC plug, and vice versa, which resulted in my 120 volt transformer outlet pissing to 30 volts between neutral and earth even when off. I don't know which dickhead company made this lead, but obviously it doesn't meet the safety standards stamped upon it, as it demonstrably fails a pat test on polarity right out of the fucking box. Anywho, let's have a closer look at my two devices before we crack open a can of Strongbow and piss around. We observed both Siemens devices have the same dimensions, however we have two different types of device. In slot 1 is a 20 amp circuit breaker with arc fault detection. In slot 2 there's a 15 amp circuit breaker also with arc fault detection plus ground fault detection. This second device is more akin to the UK gear I've previously looked at here. We Britishers know of these devices as RCBOs with arc fault detection, and these bad motherfuckers have three protective functions, overcurrent, arc fault, and earth leakage. That's the same range of functions we have in our second Siemens device here, which is rated at 15 amps for the overcurrent function, is also an AFCI, arc fault circuit interrupter, and unlike this thing on the left, is additionally also a GFCI or ground fault circuit interrupter, which is the term our American cousins would use in place of our preferred catch-all term of residual current detector or RCD. Personally, I think I prefer the AFCI abbreviation to that of RCD, although a residual current fault isn't necessarily always going to be a ground fault, I guess. Anyway, it's important we remember that the acronyms of AFCI and GFCI, as used by our American cousins, relate to our AFDD and RCD devices respectively, so that we can recognise what we're about to see when we test the big bollocks. Like my local AFDDs, our US counterparts have LED indicators to aid with diagnosing trip events. When powered on, these indicators briefly illuminate before extinguishing. Hopefully they'll provide us with some feedback when it comes to testing. Speaking of testing, well, it's about goddamn time, as our American cousins would say. So let's take a closer look at our two Klein suspects. Or perps, as again our American cousins would say, starting with the simpler RT310. And my thanks to Peter for generously procuring and passing on this one while he was in the States last year. I've had this since last October, and I'm only just now getting around to fiddling with its willy a whole year later. Both instruments take three AAA batteries up their backsides, and each feels quite weighty in the hand. Klein build this one as an outlet tester, and you can see from the LED indicators that it's much the same function as a basic socket tester as found on this uncivilised island. 
Uh, switching it on and powered, we can see a green not energized light and a yellow one showing open line or hot, as our American cousins would say, which is a rather charming term, I'm sure you'll agree. If we plug this into our, our beast, our wanky yanky rig. Okay, we can see that right on the screen there. We're now showing energized. Uh, and in this case, confirmation of correct wiring, which is nice. I, I'm, I'm glad I got my white and black wires the correct way around, as our American cousins use those colours instead of our own European harmonised brown and blue. OK, so I have circuit way one selected, and that contains my Siemens AFCI. There's no ground fault, aka residual current protection offered by this device, so the GFCI and 30 milliamp buttons on my Klein are redundant at present. Nonetheless, when pressing the AFCI button, trip the sorry son of a bitch, as our American cousins would say. Let's find out. Yeah. I have to wait for this light to stop flashing before I can undertake another test. That's probably to stop something inside from overheating. Apparently this simulates a parallel arc and is good for testing outlets up to 30 metres from the AFCI. Although it's doing jack shit at present. Device testing at the outlet is interesting though. So when testing an RCD here, one is supposed to do it at the RCD itself. That may come as a surprise to some of you, especially if you think the best test is from the socket outlet with the highest impedance. But no, I attended an IT tech talk last year where they clarified this and RCD testing as the output terminals of the device itself. You'll also find that in guidance note three incidentally. Yet these Klein contraptions, well, uh, they can only be tested at outlets. There are no flying leads or probes for pissing around back at the board. I suspect our American cousins have GFCI and AFCI protection built into their outlet, so maybe this would work better there than with equipment back at the board. I don't know, because so far it's no good. I have seen it work, although Sod's Law says it won't perform on camera for us today. Uh, when it does work, uh, I have to reset the protective device by pushing the handle down and back up again, and the LED indicator briefly illuminates to report an arc fault. Although, hang on, uh, that indicator seems to light up anyway. Uh, the <laughs> indicator just comes on with breaker power on, uh, even though it is labelled as arc fault. Doesn't seem to matter whether you press the test button or turn it mechanically on and off, off and on rather. That indicator just lights up every time. I don't get that. The indicator is labelled arc fault, but uh, hmm, there you go. Tell me out in the comments if you're familiar with the particular dukes of this thing's hazard, as our American cousins would say. Let's see what our Klein carbuncle makes of our second device. Well, hot damn, as our American cousins would say. It seems to be doing not very much here. You might also hear that when pressing the button, there's an audible rattle. That's coming from the 120 volt transformer. And you'll notice as well the neons in this socket outlet seem to flicker in sympathy with that rattle. And this is getting a little bit warm to the touch, so something's afoot inside this case, as we would say on the streets of the Bronx. It's all jolly disconcerting. Failure to function on AFCI testing seems to be a recurring theme with the handful of US AFCI instruments out there from what I've seen online. They're all pretty potluck depending on the brand of device and to test and the distance of the circuit wiring. We also have a frequency mismatch here as the UK is at 50 hertz and the US at 60 hertz. However, the Siemens and Klein spec sheets show both frequencies, so I don't think that's a factor in the cave today. Let's try the GFCI function on this second Siemens device here. Pushing the GFCI button outputs 6 to 9 milliamps, so that ought not to trouble a 30 milliamp residual current device we Brits would have installed for additional protection. My Siemens model here is rated at a paltry 5 milliamps, however, which means a push of the GFCI button should pop a cap in its ass, as our American cousins would say. Eee, sure enough. Open ground, open neutral. I wonder why I didn't say open hot. Bit weird. It also says energized still, which it clearly isn't. Uh, oh, never mind. Uh, there's uh, nothing I can press on here or do with this to sort of get those LED indicators to show anything, so I presume I just flick it down and back up to reset it. 
uh, where it shows both an arc fault and a ground fault. So, yeah, the indicators on these things seem to be absolutely fucking useless. Anyway, we've one last button to push on this little orange sodomite, and that's the 30 milliamp trip test. Well, hot diggity dog, as our American cousins would say. But how many lights will illuminate when I power back on? Tell me how many lights you see. Now, Jean-Luc, there are only two, erroneously both reporting ground and arc faults once again. Oh well, never mind. Let's move on to the RT390, generously provided for me by Andy Curl, who appeared briefly in my last Alex video in the segment where we were looking at Jimbo the electrician's camera-equipped pervert goggles. This instrument is certainly a larger and heavier affair, eschewing these simple LED indicators for a lovely high-resolution colour screen capable of conveying more information. Hmm, Klein billed this one as a circuit analyzer, which sounds more impressive, so let's see if we like the cut of its jib. Starting on device one, uh, the RC390 is reporting good wiring and shows the voltage present. Very nice. Okay, Klein, this is your time to shine. Can you test my AFCI? Well, yes you can! 139 milliseconds. Trip successful. That's rather super, isn't it? Let's reset that. Of course that light comes on because it always comes on. Let's try that again. I think it does say you've got to wait sort of 20 seconds between tests, so I probably haven't waited quite long enough, but... Uh, okay, no, it's not having it now. Oh, there we go. A little hit and miss, perhaps, but that might be because I'm not giving it enough time between tests. Although I would have thought it would just not allow me to proceed with the test if it wasn't ready. But this one still says energised as well, even though it clearly isn't. So I'm not sure what Klein are doing with their lights there. Anyway, uh, should we try that on circuit way two? Hmm. Give it another go, shall we? And no. In baseball terms, it appears to be throwing us a curveball, as our American cousins would say. Okay, never mind. Well, let's see what happens with the GFCI test. Lovely stuff. That's successful. Uh, as I said, the Siemens gear is rated at 5 milliamps, uh, which means it should trip somewhere between the 3 to 5 milliamp mark, but no higher. When a breaker or fuse has a rating, for it, then that's what it's designed to carry over what it'll blow or trip at. When it comes to residual current devices, the rating is the absolute maximum and not a milliamp more. The trip current shown here on the screen of 7.9 milliamps isn't what the Klein ramped up to before the Siemens popped. It's what the Klein pumped out immediately when I push that test button. If I do the same, you can get the two lights again. If I do the same with the 30 milliamp button, then again we should see that take out the device because it sticks in just over 30 milliamps, 31.4 to get it to actuate correctly. Uh, yeah, both lights again. Fucking useless. I, I, I must be missing something. You've got to let me know in the comments why these lights are all coming on. The RT390 also has this load button which simulates a load of 12, 15 and 20 amps and gives the volt drop. We're running off a 500 volt amp transformer so the numbers predictably don't look good. Uh, but there you go, that's, that's the uh, RT390 for you. A little more successful that one, at least with the, on the AFCI function on our first device. Maybe not anymore. <laughs> it's very hit and miss. Ah, bollocks. Oh, there we go. Perseverance is key, it seems. All jolly interesting, I'm sure you'll agree. If indeed anybody is still watching, but uh, it's about to get a little bit more interesting because I've hooked up this Metrix OX5042 oscilloscope to the output of my AFCIs. This has been uh, very kindly uh, lent to me by the good folk at Chauvin Arnoux. I've just borrowed it. I can't afford uh, shiny new equipment, but they have loaned me this one so that we can see the output waveform of our AFCIs. It doesn't really matter which AFCI I select. 
There's circuit way one, and there's circuit way two. They're both off the same transformer, so we're seeing exactly the same thing on both. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the RT390 to put out uh, the AFCI signal, waveform, whatever the hell it is, however the hell it does it, it injects something onto the line here, which we ought to be able to see on the scope. Uh, we're on circuit way two, which we have been 100% unsuccessful in falling with this equipment, so I should be able to do it as many times as I like. Let's push the button and watch the screen. Ooh. Now, like I say, the RT390 is apparently producing a parallel arc fault. So apparently that's what a parallel arc fault looks like, or kind of, or it's Klein's interpretation of such. You can see there's some degradation to the, the base sine waveform there. God, I couldn't tell you much more about it, to be honest. I'm just a, a humble, mainly domestic electrician. I'm not a scientist or anything like that. I, not, not anybody clever. So uh, I, I can't tell you much more about it, really, than, than that's the kind of signal it's injecting. Some devices it fools, some devices it, it do not. Let's switch it back to circuit way one and push the button. And that didn't trip it. Oh, but that did. And we just saw it sort of freeze on that waveform for a moment there before it uh, disappeared from view. And if I reset that, we're back in business again. Let's see if we can do it another time. Again, hit and miss, isn't it? But apparently this is what a parallel arc looks like. And whether all devices are fooled by this thing or not, well, it seems to be a not. There we go, we managed to get it again. So interesting products, these Klein things. And I've seen other examples on the US market shown on the YouTube of these AFCI testers. And they, they do seem to be more successful on the socket outlets that have them built in as opposed to on the switch gear that has it built in. So I don't know if there's something in that. Uh, some brands seem to be better than others. The client seems to be quite well received over on the other side of the pond. Seems to be doing a better job than some of the, the other models that are out there. So maybe they're onto something. I don't know. Uh, I'd love to be able to try it out against my range of AFDDs here. Sadly, these things are only rated at up to 135 volts. So no chance. But I wonder if Klein might put out something that could be used on these shores. Hmm, I did ask, and they never got back to me. Oh uh, well, like I say, I still like your Klein. Although I'm gonna have to wear your hat properly, I'm afraid. <sighs> Let's do some coffee shouts. few names to rattle out for this video. Starting with the whore that is Ollie, who says have a beer on me in case you don't get to Sandown. Linda and I were hoping to get to Sandown for the next elect show. Uh, I don't think we're going to make it, so uh, we won't be at Sandown. Uh, I'm not sure when we'll be at the next show, to be honest. I'm kind of in two minds about going to other Alexes. We'll see how things go. The whore, DVC and the place to be, who has just moved to Twickenham for some work. I was just chatting to you on, on your own YouTube channel this weekend, wasn't I, Stevie C? Uh, do go and check out Stevie C's channel and all these ele electronics geniuses that I, I wish I was, but sadly I'm not. I've got a couple of lighting projects that Stevie sent me. And he, oh, it's getting on for nearly a year now that I really ought to, to get on with. Artistic applications for those, if I can pull my thumb out my ass and get on with them. Uh, the whore that is Jay Sargent. Uh, always difficult being polite to traffic wardens. That Chauvin MFT was rather sexy too. Yes, the tra traffic one was a prick. The Chauvin MFT is rather sexy. Uh, I've just done some how-to videos on how to drive that. So I'm kind of using that as my go-to at the moment because I need to make sure that I'm, I'm very familiar with it and how it works because I've just done the, the, the how-to videos for Chauvin's channel. If you haven't already checked that out, go check it out. There is a video coming showing Linda and I building a test rig, a three-phase test rig that we that we did there. I know it's all getting a bit samey, this stuff coming out on this channel. I'm sorry. There's just lots and lots of, lots of new ideas out there. But uh, yeah, well, I'll try and get that one out perhaps next. It's, it's already half edited. I've just got to, again, put my, put my thumb out my ass. 
Uh, a promotion to whore for armchair bastard. I hope this goes some way to contributing to the broken window. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I, a couple of videos back I did, or was it the last video? I forget now. I, I did break a window. But, but th thank you for your contribution towards its speedy repair by the, uh, the emergency glazer. The whore that is Jim Hook from Down Under, who has been busily replacing Duff LED fittings himself by the sound of it, replacing uh, lamppost lights by the sounds of it. Uh, I'm sorry that you're experiencing LED failures down there, Jim. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we're all experiencing it. I know that my uh, wholesalers, both Demons and CEF, have said that they can probably still get fluorescent stuff after Christmas, but they're not going to keep it actively stocked anymore. Uh, once the, the warehouse stocks are exhausted, that's it. There's an awful lot of fluorescent stuff out there, and I think it's such a shame that that technology is being retired because it's so robust and tried and tested and uses far fewer components than the hundreds of components that go into LED lighting. So I think that, you know, completely obsoleting it is not right, in my opinion. I don't think that you're getting any environmental benefit for churning out a load of LED stuff. That's often shite. The whore, oldest apprentice in the northwest. Hope this goes somewhere to covering the broken window and the wanker traffic wardens. Well, that's nice, isn't it? Two two contributions towards my broken window and my asshole traffic warden. Wanker traffic warden, as oldest apprentice in the northwest says. The whore, that is test gear junkie, of course, was at Alex and uh, attended the curry. Best curry I've had in ages. Can't wait for the next one. Say test gear junkie. Well, there you go. Uh, I presume that will be uh, next September, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, the whore that is Mr. Humbug. Always nice to see you, Mr. Humbug. And as usual, no comment has been left. But uh, it's, it's still nice to have you here, even if you haven't got much to say. No super wanks for this one, but some special mentions. Peter for the RT310. Thank you so much for that. I've literally had that for a year. And it's, it's about time I did something with it. So I'm, I'm glad we've seen it in action, even though a lot of it was in inaction, so to speak. Also, Andy Curl, of course, as I've already mentioned, for the RT390. And another a generous contribution, because getting these things both purchased and shipped from the US of A sure is probably quite pricey. Chuck Kirchner for being one of our useful American cousins. Thank you for your advice on the uh, the load center stuff, Chuck. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't take your advice when it came to buying the board. It's just so expensive around here. There was only one supplier I could find who was actually selling US gear. Uh, and even then it, it wasn't on these shores. It got imported in, so it took a while to turn up and cost a few quid. But there, there's just, I suppose there's no, unless you're an American air base or something, then you're just not going to see this this sort of stuff. And goodness knows if what they've got, maybe they've got our stuff or their stuff, who knows. But I know that it's hard to get hold of. Uh, sorry for any misconceptions as well. I'm really not used to the uh, American way of doing things. So there may have been things I said wrong in this video, but I'm sure that you commentards will pick me up on. Uh, and finally, the, for thank yous to Julian and co at Chauvin Arnoux for lending me your lovely shiny oscilloscope, which hopefully I haven't kicked around and scuffed up too much. I shall make sure that gets back to you in one piece. Just like to say a quick hello as well to Thomas and Friend, who we bumped into, or I bumped into at CEF last week. Uh, it sounds a bit tank engine, that, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, nice to bump into you, Thomas. I hope you got your faulty JCC lights sorted out. <laughs> uh, and I think that's it. I'm just going to say a, a get well soon to Linda, who was supposed to be back out in the van this week and has gone and done her bloody back in again uh, and is literally at Warwick Hospital as we speak. So that was rather unfortunate. Um, but there you go. Hopefully she'll be back in the chair soon. Yeah, I was hoping that she'd be out tomorrow. We're, well, I'm planning on filming tomorrow's job, so uh, maybe there'll be something different to show, or maybe it'll all go to cock. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, thanks for tuning in on this one. Catch you next time. <laughs>